Welcome to Worship with Spirit in the Hills Lutheran Church this Sunday. It is good to be with you. A special welcome to those celebrating Father's Day today. For all who share the fatherly and the parental love of God, we give thanks. Whether it's your first time joining us or you are back again, your presence with us in worship digitally or when we do gather in person, in person is a gift to our community. And we want to accompany you in your faith journey. A few opportunities we have for you to engage with us include videos here on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. So be sure to like and subscribe, to like and follow so that you don't miss any of those as well as head over to our website, spiritinthehills.org. And if you go to spiritinthehills.org slash live, you'll find opportunities to connect for worship every single weekend, as well as to sign up to receive emails from us about other opportunities for Bible study and things during the week. We worship together on Facebook Live and on our website, spiritinthehills.org slash live and facebook.com slash spiritinthehills at 10 a.m., for about 30 or 40 minutes every Sunday morning right now. So we want you to join us in that way too. This part of our worship together is the gospel reading and sermon for the day. Last week's gospel from Matthew, the end of chapter 9 and part of chapter 10, left off with Jesus sending out the disciples. And he continues on between last Sunday's gospel reading and this Sunday's gospel reading telling the disciples very plainly of the struggles that they will face as they're sent out carrying nothing to go and give freely and to be dependent on God. And as they're sent out, they'll face opposition. And yet Jesus will tell them in our gospel today not to fear. So yes, this work of the ministry of the good news of God, proclaiming the gospel that the kingdom of heaven has come near, that God's love is for you and for all, that is going to raise some opposition. It's not an easy task, but it is a powerful one. And Jesus, when he sends them out, he sends them out with nothing except all of the authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to preach the good news, because it's God's word that will be there with them. So we continue that gospel reading about about the sending of Jesus' disciples in Matthew chapter 10 today. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. We say glory to you, O Lord. Jesus continued telling them, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciples to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing is secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and, no, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. 
and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the gospel of our Lord. We respond, praise to you, O Christ. This is a difficult passage. In fact, we've got a couple of them. We've got one in our our Old Testament text from Jeremiah where he's just letting God have it because he is upset at the way that things are going because he's been preaching God's word and people don't like it. And they don't like him because he's preaching it. He's become a laughing stock. In the same way, Jesus is telling the disciples just how difficult, divisive, and draining it will be to proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. It is difficult and divisive and draining work to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And Jesus tells us that plainly. But I want to start back with that Jeremiah text. So Jeremiah has been preaching and living God's word and it has made him a laughingstock, an outcast, an endlessly derided and condescended fool among his own people. You see, Jeremiah had this great encounter with God and God's word filled his presence and called him into action as a prophet to proclaim the word of God, to speak the truth that God had placed in Jeremiah's bones. And Jeremiah thought he got to be special because of this call, that people would look up to him and love him and that things would go so well for him. And in fact, just the opposite has happened. And Jeremiah turns with strong words. He says, God, you enticed me. That word entice is kind of like a word, uh, the the Hebrew word could also be translated seduced. You fooled me, you tricked me, you lulled me in. I wanted to be something and it's been just the opposite. You enticed and seduced and deceived me. Jeremiah tells God, "It, it feels like you took advantage of me when I was vulnerable and I was played a fool. Here I sit, a laughingstock, I can't even open my mouth before they mock me. Jeremiah has spoken the truth and shined the light of God's word and it has revealed something that people would rather not see. Something they would rather turn away from, make fun of, ignore, dismiss. Especially the people with the power to make you feel like nothing. They're the ones that really didn't want to see it. And they're letting Jeremiah know by making him feel like nothing. Jesus knows fully well that the ministry of the gospel, he knows intimately, we see it in the the gospel accounts. He knows that this ministry, this mission that God has placed him on to bring about the reign of heaven on earth here and now to bring abundant and everlasting life for the world is going to be met with opposition. He's already being met with opposition. He's already being called the prince of demons by the religious and political authorities. In bringing the good news of God to bear in word and deed, healing the sick, casting out the demons, Jesus has been met with fierce opposition. And he knows where it leads, that it leads to the cross. He's already telling his disciples, this is the path that I am on. This is what it means to follow me. And I know that my engaging in this work leads to opposition and to opposition that's likely to end and for Jesus will end in state-sanctioned violent death. It leads Jesus to the cross. He's already talking openly and honestly about the division that his mission brings and the way violence is spurred up because violence and division especially and fear are the tools wielded by the rulers of the world. They want to instill fear and maintain their rule. The saying in verse 34 is crucial as Stanley Saunders, professor at Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, points out. That saying about coming to bring a sword and not just peace is crucial. 
Although Jesus has called his disciples to be peacemakers, we think back to the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, his mission does not bring peace but a sword so long as the powers so long as the powers resist God's rule and will. When the powers of the world whose favorite tool is fear and threat of violence and violence, when they oppose God, then of course God's mission that Jesus is fulfilling brings not peace but a sword. Saunders continues, the very act of peacemaking as Jesus' ministry demonstrates generates violence for healing, restoration, and the conquest of death threaten the foundations of all human assertions of power in defiance of God. What, what Saunders is saying is that human powers that would seek to defy God or have wandered from God's ways or who have made themselves into the most powerful thing, these human powers are threatened by God's way of peace and healing and life and wholeness. And if God says, you can't even put anyone to death, then God has removed their biggest threat of power. And for that, they will try and fight with every ounce of power they think or do have. The gospel ministry is difficult for Jesus' disciples, and Jesus is letting them know. He is addressing that directly. He knows that fear will cause failure in the mission of discipleship, and so Jesus chooses to handle their fear with a direct address. He will not ignore it or push it aside or downplay it. He will lay out worst case scenario after worst case scenario with brutal honesty. He will talk about the difficulties and the division and the derision and threats that the disciples and any who would seek to follow Jesus and defy those who would say they have the ultimate power or are the ultimate power will be met with. On the one hand, Jesus has given his followers incredible power and authority. That was last week's gospel message when he sends them out. He's giving them the same authority that has been given to him as God's only son. He places that upon his followers. And then on the other hand, he sends them out as vulnerable as sheep in the midst of wolves, fully dependent on God and neighbor. Their mission to proclaim the good news of God's reign come near puts them on a collision course with those who quite like the reign of Caesar. And so Jesus highlights the suffering and its causes that they will be met with. And in naming them, he's helping them take the first step in getting past their fear. To name exactly what it is that causes us to be afraid because that's the first step in our freedom from the bondage of fear. Throughout our gospel reading, Jesus echoes the refrain, do not fear. Did you hear it again and again and again? Do not fear because Jesus knows fear of these divisions, fear of this opposition, Fear of raising conflict, fear of it not being easy, fear of messing up and doing the wrong thing, fear of being met with violence or even arrest or death. That fear will keep them from doing the work that God has called them to do. Fear of having their mothers or fathers not like what they said or how they're living when they follow Jesus. Fear of having their kids question what they're doing when they follow Jesus. It's going to set them up at odds, and Jesus knows that to free them from the bounds of that fear, he must tell them again and again, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. He tells them throughout the gospel reading, and even as he tells them plainly of the worst-case scenarios they might meet as disciples, he, they call Jesus' name so they'll certainly, uh, uh, sorry, the worst case scenario is like letting them know, you know, they call Jesus Beelzebub. They're going to say worse things about those who would seek to follow this Jesus. They 
They know that as followers of Jesus, they'll have to face conflict and division among people they love and those they call their own because they will be living out a truth that some would rather not know. For you and me today, right now, it is also difficult to be about the ministry of the kingdom of heaven. You see, in our day too, when we proclaim the good news of God through word and deed and live God's reign, we are put on a collision course with the physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental powers that would seek to reign instead of God. We see some of those forces at work, the forces that would rather bring death or the threat of death than life. You know, one of the things that is really hard and can freeze many of us is the fear of what other people will think of us or how they will respond to us if we speak up for the oppressed and the marginalized, if we plead the case of the orphan and the widow as God calls us to, if we hear somebody else talk about those people and we say, what do you mean those people? That's our family. That's our brothers and sisters. That's a beloved bearer of God's own image that you are talking about. We are called to love and to serve them. When we pray for those who are our enemies, and we show them love, it upsets people who would rather get even or get revenge. Which often isn't just even, but is a step ahead in an escalation of violence. It is hard in a world of systemic racism and coronavirus with these problems that seem just gargantuanly big. That, that can freeze us in the fear of doing the wrong thing, not doing enough, not being able to take care of it, and keep us from the ministry and mission God has called us to do to address those things, to bring healing, to fight for life and love, to strive for justice and peace, even as it brings some division. It is difficult work, but it is hope-filled work. So let's go back through Jeremiah, Jesus, the disciples, and our, us as disciples today and talk about the hope there. You see, for Jeremiah, the only thing that is more unbearable than being a laughing stock and being made to feel like nothing is not speaking God's word, not living out his call as a prophet. You see, that would be worse to turn away from the truth and walk away from the call to follow God alone is harder because Jeremiah describes it as the word of God in him like a fire in his bones that will consume him entirely. For Jesus, he will come to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where he is pressed like an olive is pressed. And in that moment of prayer, in that place where he is squeezed, he will lead with faith as he says, Father, not my will, but yours. Where his fear and love of God is bigger than any fear of opposition from the powers of the world, including what is about to be his arrest and crucifixion and death. For Jesus' disciples, what is there to fear? Jesus points out in our gospel reading today, why do you fear the ones who you know, can kill you? Why are you fearing the people with the military might and power? Because sure, they can kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. The only one that can really bring about death and destruction is God. And... God chooses love instead. God chooses to forgive our sins, to work in and through us, to bring life, not death. Jesus says, look at the sparrows. God cares for them and cares even more for you. So if you were going to fear anyone, fear God and know that God acts with love. And God is about bringing abundant life for everyone. Not about bringing death. 
for you and me right now, uh, let me tell you about myself. I am what uh, the Enneagram is this model of uh, personality. It's, it's like some other ones, but also different. But one of the things that it helped me learn about myself is I really, really, really hate conflict. Like it makes me ill. I'll be thinking about uh, how upset I'll make people days before I even might have a chance to make them upset. It just makes me squirm. It, it gives me stomach issues sometimes. Um, I really, really, really don't like conflict, but we are to fear and love God more than we fear the creation of conflict. And I think that's part of what Jesus says. And don't you realize that I didn't come to bring a cheap peace that's an absence of conflict. I came to bring a true peace that's a presence of love and justice for all of God's beloved. And in doing so, it's going to bring conflict. That's part of what is going to happen. So I don't like conflict. Yet, in facing that conflict, I am freed from the fear of conflict. And I find that I actually enjoy working through it because it brings us together in a new way and it helps us move forward into a new and better life, more aligned with God's will and ways. In talking openly with his followers and in reading this text as Jesus' followers today, we're faced with our fears, but we're able to face our fears. You see, Jesus talks about worst case scenarios and says, do not fear. Don't you know God is with you? God loves you. You matter so much to God. You have all authority to do what you need to do. And yet you have to do it in this vulnerable way because that is the way of God. The way of God is the way of the cross. The way in which you identify yourselves and put yourself alongside those who have been pushed to the margins. The rebels who refuse to align themselves with Roman authority. Because because you are alongside them, it means that you have picked up your cross too. To stand with them and to be with them no matter what opposition comes your way because you know that God uses what seems weak in the world and yet it is more powerful than we can imagine. That God chooses an instrument of death to bring life to the whole world and to conquer death. That God is able to remove every fear by instilling us with perfect love and pushing us out into the world to be that perfect love so that we are freed in our bodies and minds and actions to go and love with that radically inclusive, world-changing love of God. Friends, what is covered up is being revealed, and some of us don't want to see and hear that truth. Years, decades, centuries of systemic racism and violence, especially against black people in this country, is being shown to us more and more. Those of us who are white, at least for many of our brothers and sisters of color, and especially those who are black, they know it all too well. But as it was covered up, it is being revealed. The things that were spoken about on the margins are being talked about in the center. And some of us who like the way things are and benefit from the way things are, or didn't ever see the problems, would rather turn away. Have you ever been watching the news lately and just felt like you needed to turn it off? You could not take the pain. You could not take the brokenness. You would rather continue along a different path. You would ignore it and turn away. But the truth kept creeping in like fire within in our bones, the word of God, who is truth, the person of Jesus Christ who says, I am the truth, is within us, revealing those things to us and sending us out to follow God and to do this work, no matter how hard it is or what divisions and difficulties we endure. What is covered up is revealed, so shine the, that revealing light of Christ in the truth and love you speak and live. When we look at the causes of our fear, we see through the facade of human power and we see God's power to overcome it all. 
Even that fear rooted in death, we see more clearly the eternal life God has in store for us now and forever as we face those fears. You see, when we gain awareness of the conflict, opposition, and division that the gospel inevitably inevitably produces because there are powers in this world that would rather be in charge than God and are working to make that happen or acting like it's the case, when we see and gain awareness of that conflict and opposition and division that the gospel brings, we are freed from the bondage of fear that keeps our mouths silent and our bodies still. To go and do the work that God has called us to be and do, to share God's love in all of our actions and words. When we receive God's grace and let it fill us with a deep awareness and conviction, the fire in our bones that God is present in the world in the ways of mercy and compassion and justice and love, then we are freed for living, guided by those things. And we find the life that God has given us. Know that you are of great value to God. You are of great value to God. God who cares about the smallest and littlest things of the world. Ones that have been assigned two for a penny kind of value. God cares so much about you. Trust that you have a role in God's mission here and now. Hope defiantly when the path ahead is filled with difficult things. Give freely for you received without payment. Experience the life God has brought forth in you for such a time as this. Proclaim the good news through your simplicity, vulnerability, and dependence on God. For the gospel proclaimed and lived is the most powerful tool at your disposal. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our gospel and sermon. Again, be sure to like and subscribe here on our YouTube page and to like and follow us here on Facebook. We'll be worshiping live on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash spirit in the hills and our website, www.spiritinthehills.org slash live on Sundays at 10 a.m. We hope that you'll join us there and leave a comment wherever you find this video so that we can follow up with you and accompany you on your journey of faith. Until we see each other again, grace and peace be with you.